The question that I just posed was what leads to the enhanced stability associated with coordination compounds containing chelating ligands? Let's think about the two nickel complexes. In the two complexes, six NH or Ni N bonds are formed, regardless of which complex you look at. So we should believe that the enthalpy associated with each compound should be about the same, and numerically it is. The increased stability of these complexes can be based upon the idea of bonding changes. What do I mean? Entropy. So let's take a look at just a simple way to think about this. In the first reaction, on the reactant side, you have seven chemical species. One, NH, uh, Ni h 2 plus, and six NH3s. After the reaction occurs where NH3 replaces H2O, you have Ni NH362 plus and six waters. The products also have seven chemical species. The entropy did not change much during this reaction. In the second reaction, on the reactant side, there are four chemical species. You have the NiH20622 plus and three ethylene diamine ligands. When this reaction occurs, you have an increase in the number of product molecules when compared to the reactant molecules. You form e, uh, NiEN32 plus and 6H2Os. The enthalpy change for both reactions are almost identical. However, the second reaction has a greater increase in entropy. This means that the Gibbs free energy, delta G0, which is a measure of the spontaneity of the reaction, increases. So, the more negative the value for delta G, the more spontaneous the reaction will be. As delta S increases, the negative T delta S becomes more negative. This leads to an increase or a more negative value of delta G. And delta G is directly proportional to the natural log of the formation constant. So as delta G changes, the formation constant also changes. There is a second explanation for the chelate effect as well. When one end of the multidentate ligand attaches to the metal cation, you have that other end just hanging out there, but it's very close to another coordination spot on the metal cation. This increases the probability that this bidentate ligand will bond two times quickly to the metal cation, forming a stable compound. When looking at the chelate effect, the ideal length of a chelating chain is about four atoms, so one, two, three, four. Five atoms works very well too, leading to uh, a six-membered ring. Um, this leads to the formation of five-membered rings when you're using a chain length of four. The formation of five and six-membered rings are very stable due to the bond angles being nearly 90 degrees at the metal cation. So you need to keep in mind those two effects, the chelate effect and hard soft acid base chemistry. We may talk about those when we're, when we're talking about the applications of coordination compounds. Be sure to remember, though, that it's very important that uh, uh, you understand both of, those uh, both of those concepts. Now, when we talk about the applications of coordination compounds, there are many. Back when you took analytical chemistry, 
You've had many, many different uses, such as complexometric titrations, usually done with EDTA. Um, it's also used in detergents. As a matter of fact, um, detergents contain surfactants, and also uh, they contain coordination compounds that are very important to the activity of the detergents for cleaning, uh, cleaning clothes and cleaning other things. It has biological uses as well. For example, oxygen transport in our body is carried by is done through hemoglobin. Proteins that have been isolated for anaerobic bacteria, that means bacteria that do not use uh, oxygen, are very important as well to help uh, to help in their energy formation. And rubridoxins and ferrodoxins do just that. And finally, some bacteria can do nitrogen fixation, and they have to have this enzyme called nitrogenase. What we're going to focus on for the rest of this discussion are the biological uses of coordination compounds. Let's start off by thinking about cellular respiration. This is a biological process where O2 reacts with glucose to form energy in the form of ATP and it also produces the side products of carbon dioxide and water. What's happening in your body is an enzyme metabolized combustion where glucose reacts with O2 to form energy, carbon dioxide, and water. O2 is transported throughout the body using red blood cells. The part of the red blood cells that bind to O2 is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four different heme subunits containing four iron cations, which is very important. So, let's look at the structure of hemoglobin. You can see one, two, three, four different subunits. These are proteins, polypeptides, that are folded around this heme center. Now, when heme, when we just look at the heme, we have this very complex ring system around the center. There's the iron right there, and the iron has a protein bonded to one end, and then it has this other site which can bond something like O2, or it doesn't have to bond anything. You should notice that O2 has a bent geometry when it's bonded to the heme group. Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw all four of these, but I want you to be able to have an I I want you to have an idea of what this looks like here. You have hemoglobin that is bonded to a protein residue. I think this is histidine if I'm correct. Then you have this porphyrin ring where four nitrogens bond to the iron. And then you have oxygen that is bond in, bonded in a bent geometry to the iron. You need to think about why that is. Now, O2 transportation throughout the body is, a, um, is an equilibrium idea. Hemoglobin, Hb, which is darkish purple red, will pick up O2 in the lungs. So Hb, which is hemoglobin, picks up O2 and the equilibrium shifts towards making HbO2. HbO2 is known as oxyhemoglobin and it's bright red blood. It travels through the body until it reaches cells that have a low O2 concentration. The O2 is released from the heme group into the cell with low oxygen concentration. When one heme center in the hemoglobin is oxygenated, it enhances the ability of the other centers to also bind O2. The binding of oxygen to one of the heme centers changes the shape of the protein, making the other three heme groups more likely to pick up oxygen. 
Now, Fe2 plus is not oxidized by the O2. The protein structure protects Fe2 plus from the oxidation. Now, when both O2 and CO are around, heme preferentially bonds to CO, forming carboxyhemoglobin. And actually, the formation constant for carboxyhemoglobin is 250 times that 